Hello, good afternoon from Brussels and welcome to another episode of the uh, campaign workshop organized by the European Campaign Playbook. My name is Sebastian and I will be your host today. The European Campaign Playbook is a community of pro-European campaigners who want to help the European cause by sharing best practices, by networking and even better by finding synergies across countries, across regions, and in the end, fight for the values upon which the EU, our European project, was founded. One of the ways we, uh, we do this, and we do this type of best practices and networking uh, events are by holding campaign workshops with experts. Now, this is what we are gonna be doing today, let me explain you briefly how we are going to, to roll. The first one, uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna have a chat with three experts who come from different uh, perspectives and different life paths. We will have Nadia Olescu, who is an activist and founding member of Strach Kovjet. That is the pro-women's uh, pro women's right movement in Poland. We will ask her at the end of this workshop, what are the techniques, the strategies, the tactics that this successful movement has used to rally people behind their cause in Poland? Second, we will have the digital consultant, the digital campaigner. Uh, and for that, we will uh, have Lucas Holter, who is the managing director for politics at Campaigning Bureau which is a digital, um, uh, digital agency based in Vienna. And last but not least, we will have the tech guy, meaning the person who usually comes providing the technology that makes movements scale or that help movements scale, help uh, organizations get in touch with supporters, help organizations get their message across. And that is uh, Christoph Slafer from uh, Cam Builder. Now, uh, before I introduce you to, to the first two guests, let me say that this is an event, this event has been made possible thanks to our networking sponsor for this month, that is Cam Builder. Together, we thought that the best thing to talk about this month is about how to build movements in a digital age. And throughout the month, we've been posting content, we have been asking you what are the things that have inspired you, the movements that have inspired you. So thank you very much for engaging with us throughout the month, because I think at the end, uh, by the end of November, we will become better campaigners. And that is the objective of, of, of this community in the end. Camp Builder is your software to, to mobilize people, is your software to build uh, movements and it's a software totally made in Europe. So uh, it's always great to have uh, European technology and to showcase the best of the European technology in the campaign industry. And we're very thankful for their support this month. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our first two, two guests. Then we will uh, take a small break and introduce the third guest, uh, who is uh, Nadia, who will be joining us from Poland. So here we have uh, Christoph. Hello, Christoph. Hello, Sebastian. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I, I can't wait to, to, to share with the audience how is the feeling, because we are now in Vienna, so how, you know, what's the, the feeling, what's happening there, uh, because uh, I, I think it's, it's we're seeing this in so many cities now. Um, so it would be great. It would be great to to hear that update from Vienna, which can also be made by Lucas, who is joining us from Vienna too. Hi, Lucas. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so, uh, so sure. in Vienna these days. Uh, actually, I think Lucas can answer this question better. I'm, I'm living outside of Vienna, uh, but but we're before lockdown, so. Um, yeah, getting used to, to working from home again, I guess. Yeah, Austria Austria got hit by the, four, uh, by the fourth wave of this pandemic um, uh, very hard. 
uh, and therefore we are in, in lockdown. A lot of us work from home. I'm in office for today uh, and for this um, exchange, with, which I very appreciate. Thanks for the invitation um, and the organization. Um, I really look forward to the discussion, to the exchange, and um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, to give something, some insights from from our perspective. Thank you, thank you both. This wouldn't be possible without the actual experts on the on the field. So I, I want to start. Uh, I'm going to start diving in, and, and I would suggest that we are going to start with the view from the consultant. So these type of persons who, who come to HQ, to the campaign HQ, with a full team, and they they have all the solutions, they have all the strategies, and they help campaigns win, which is uh, the the end goal. And, and that is, uh, Lucas, uh, tell us a little bit more about your story. So how you came uh, to, to to work in the in the campaigning industry and also your work at uh, Campaigning Bureau. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. So um, um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, as, is, as it was mentioned before, I'm uh, Lucas Holter. I'm the managing director um, uh, of Campaigning Bureau, one of three managing directors. And my focus is um, on all our politic uh, campaigns um, we do in, uh, especially in German speaking countries and uh, beyond uh, with our consultations, um, uh, focusing on, yeah, really mobilizing people uh, within campaigns, focusing and deeply, um, yeah, our roots are in polit political campaigns and uh, uh, election campaigns. So therefore our, um, uh, yeah, we are especially focusing on mobilization. Uh, I'm in campaign business, so to speak, or I, I, I'm, I describe myself as campaigner for 10 years now, um, uh, seven years uh, uh, within the campaigning bureau. Uh, before I started um, 10 years ago uh, within the youth organization, I volunteered, I organized um, uh, a lot of uh, campaigns um, and this, yeah, this uh, strong um, uh, this like this uh, this emotion that comes with with campaigning uh, really um, uh, yeah, fascinated me. Um, and after that, I joined um, a political party and, um, and joined the team of uh, uh, Sebastian Kurz uh, with his first uh, election campaign back in 2013. Um, uh, and yeah, back then uh, uh, his team was very small. Uh, and uh, I did like everything a digital campaigner, uh, uh, I would say, uh, does uh, from texting emails, uh, producing content for social media, uh, providing texts and, and images and, and videos for, for website building, landing pages. Um, and I really loved doing that and uh, loved being in, in like, like the headquarter of a campaign and, um, and do a lot of uh, communication stuff. And, uh, back then, I, I got to know Philip, uh, our founder um, at Campaigning Bureau, uh, uh, who worked um, uh, with the campaign back then with Campaigning Bureau. Um, and after the campaign, I joined Campaigning Bureau and learned uh, really from, from the base basics, um, um, the methodology uh, around mobilization, what really gets people engaged, what uh, does a campaign need to do, how is the campaign pl planned? And um, after some years, I focused on strategies and consulting. Um, and now for two years, I I lead the political department. And for nearly one year, I am uh, a managing director. Uh, and, and let me go a little bit off script now. I know you, you have something to share, but I, most of the people who are following us today and who are members of our community, they... They are campaigners themselves, as I explained at the beginning. And one of the recurrent things that they always mention is, how do you build a career in politics and in campaigns? And, and what you have described, it's, it's pretty much the, 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 it's one of the many ways. No? You started volunteering probably with an organization back home, and then you started to go up the ranks, uh, doing, like you said, whatever was necessary. Uh, to to get the to push the, the message and to get the message across, then join the party and then when you have possessed or when you have all these skills and uh, uh, contacts and networking, right? In the end, is what this is all about. That led you to to be one of the managing directors of a successful 
digital agency? Is that the path that you would recommend people to follow? Or is there, you know, is that something that, you know, was it a straight line? Uh, or was it a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you you mentioned important stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like a straight line uh, when I describe it afterwards. Uh, 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 I think Steve Jobs said uh, connecting the dots backwards is easy, uh, and and it seems like a straight line. And obviously, it wasn't that planned. And I um, a long time ago, I I wanted to be a lawyer, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, clearly not the path uh, that uh, that I followed. But I think. Uh, uh, politics and campaign in general uh, because uh, in campaigning we don't do only politic uh, politicians uh, campaigns but also uh, campaigns for corporates campaigns for brands for ngos so uh, what really uh, fascinated me was was working within the campaign working with a crowd of of like-minded people who share uh, common values who share your cause and to really organize this this group of uh, of like-minded people and this this power that uh, that uh, comes out of the campaign that fascinated me and so therefore yeah, i think um thinking back uh, i i think i had a lot of chances i i took and i i got uh, provided uh, because my role in the different campaigns yeah, it was an offer, and, uh, and I took it, and I took the chance, and people believed in me, uh, and especially Philip, um, uh, my colleague as managing director and, and mentor uh, to this day, um, uh, really uh, believed in me and believed in my, my my talent and my work, and gave me chances to to yeah to to improve, to get better in 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 campaigning and to learn. Um, and to fail uh, and uh, everything, I think that's that's the normal way, uh, uh, trial and error. Um, and I got a lot of chances, um, and I even uh, uh, got chances within the politics, and I declined them. And I'm happy about it because uh, now I got my path in campaigning bureau um, and have um, have the possibilities to work with so many campaigns. Um, um, and maybe uh, politics waits for me. Uh, some some years from now. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that story because I, I can tell you that this it's the it's the question number one uh, for especially young uh, uh, campaigners who uh, really are passionate about their job. It's all about uh, you know being there, being present, being mm. uh, available. Uh, of course, always uh, working with the option political option that feels more closer to you and then uh, doing a lot of networking and because at the, in the end people will pull you up and yeah. and you know uh, looking backwards it makes sense probably as you were transitioning it wasn't that clear but uh, yeah. happy that uh, it turned out great so uh, you have a master class for us uh, or at least you're going to explain us a little bit what you do with the campaigning bureau and uh, hopefully some of the you know, uh, success stories that you can share with us. Please, uh, uh, let's share the screen. Let's start sharing the screen. And uh, for the, take as much time as, as you need. And, and then after the presentation, we will start a discussion uh, between the three of us. Perfect. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sebastian. Uh, if you uh, be so nice as, as to give me a sign if my presentation is now, um, uh, uh, on screen it's working. is working everything yeah perfect um i can i can't see you but i can hear you now um uh, just to just to make sure uh thanks again for for the introduction and the and the and the, the, um, uh, the discussion but uh, i and um however I, I prepared some slides how to build a successful movement and um, um what what you mentioned before what really persuades people to jump in, what really pers uh, persuades people to join a campaign, uh, what gets people moving, that's, I think that's the, the hardest part. Um, and I brought to you some uh, insights, what, what we do, what, what we did, but I'm uh, especially focused on our, yeah, uh, key factors we believe in, um, what, what, what you need to keep in mind. So 
as I mentioned before, uh, we in Campaigning Bureau, we don't uh, only work for politics. Uh, we all also work for corporates and uh, NGOs because uh, we believe uh, that every part, every segment can um, learn from each other. Uh, I think uh, what corporates can learn from the political side and even NGOs is really to build this grassroots movement to uh, to really mobilize people. Um, and on the other hand, uh, what politics can learn from corporates is uh, how to build a brand, how to stay consistent within your brand, within your messaging. Uh, and uh, of course, there are a lot of differences in the circumstances of political con uh, communication and corporate communication. But um, um, a methodologic, methodological view um, and, uh, and yeah, like a, to, to see some patterns, I think it's very useful to to share this, uh, the insights from the different perspectives. So I uh, will give you some examples from political side, but also some examples from corporate side where we see our uh, like um, uh, key factors for success uh, proven. To start with, I think um, let's face some challenges. Um, uh, a lot of our clients, a lot of our organizations we work with uh, are facing, and I think they are very similar in, in the different uh, for the different organizations. Uh, and I start with something uh, that I think gets harder and harder day by day, um, and even uh, especially in the last two to five years, I think that uh, that uh, the first challenge hit us all uh, working in, in, in communication field. Uh, I call it the channel jungle. So uh, what am I what am I meaning uh, by that? Every day, uh, so to speak, uh, a new platform rises, a new trend pops out, uh, uh, be it TikTok, a new TikTok challenge, or, or be it uh, a new uh, news platform, a new channel one should um, communicate on, uh, a new messenger service. So the channel jungle um, uh, hits us all day by day because uh, no one knows which channel uh, to communicate first uh, and uh, uh, what you also need to implement with your campaign. So I think that is a big challenge for all of us working in, in the communication field, how to stick to your strategy, how to stick to your plan and how to really uh, get to your uh, target group. And I think the hard thing is a feeling and the challenge that yeah, sometimes you even have to uh, to get attention. You often have to like uh, play the role of the clown uh, and and really uh, uh, make fun of yourself to get attention. And I think that's that's uh, like a, a development I I see that's very uh, critical for uh, for campaigns. Um, and I afterwards I want to show uh, show you uh, how we. Um, uh, um, handle this and uh, what we are focusing on. But I think the challenge for everybody um, uh, and for anyone working in communication uh, is is pretty much the same. The second challenge, so the first channel, uh, uh, challenge was the channel jungle. Uh, the second challenge we are facing is uh, that we have more players on the field. Um, um, thinking back uh, when when political parties, interest groups, and uh, organizations uh, communicated um, within the media, uh, within the press, uh, with campaigns. Um, but with the rise of, of social media, of course, with uh, the digitalization, and uh, you see it in the pandemic now, everyone, and nearly anyone uh, with a smartphone, uh, can develop a really large and strong audience uh, for the good or the bad, uh, um, uh, you can see that, um, beside, and, and strong audience beside the traditional media. So I think one challenge for um, classic organizations, for institutions, for parties is that you don't only compete with your competitors, uh, with other parties, with other political parties or other interest groups, you also compete with, yeah, Everybody who uh, has a has a voice uh, on the internet um, and wants to share it and uh, and builds a community around it. And uh, in Austria and also in Germany, I know it. Uh, there are big problems uh, uh, arising within the pandemic with within Telegram groups uh, who spread some nonsense. And that's the downside. The the upside is that 
Uh, and the good news is that everybody can um, build strong communities and build movements. So the question is for campaigners is how to use those yeah, new possibilities within your campaign um, and to yeah, really uh, compete against uh, the players on the field. And I think the, the third challenge I want to discuss is that um, we feel a loss of commitment. Um, when I talk to our clients, nearly everybody says um, they see a loss of commitment. It's, it's getting harder to get people engaged. It's getting harder to get people really committed to, to uh, get a new member of a party, of an organization. Uh, so I think a lot of organizations out there struggle and see that something changed over the years, um, be it uh, the, the, the church, be it the political parties uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, be it uh, NGOs like the Red Cross, we're working for the Austrian Red Cross. Uh, they also uh, share the similar stories um, that they that it's getting harder and harder to get people mobilized, get people engaged and uh, build long term relationships. Um, and I think that are three main challenges beside a lot of lot of more, I, I, um, I assume, but um, these three challenges um, think I think are, are, are very very common and very similar in, in the different um, segments um, of our clients and I think um, uh, at you um, as well. So what are we doing now? And I want to share three main learnings, lessons learned um, and give you some insights um, with um, every uh, to every uh, three uh, um, chapter. So the first thing I will um, um, focus on in the following is create belonging through identity. How to build a strong bond with your community is the fundament I think every movement needs. How to build a strong identity around which a community builds. That's the first thing I will talk about. The second thing I will talk about is lower the barriers and raise the value. Uh, it sounds uh, cynical, but it, uh, in, in practice, I, I'll show you how it's done, how to lower the barriers to entry, how to lower the barriers to get people involved uh, and raise the value of their engagement. Um, another key to build a strong movement. And in the third part, I will focus on connection and empowerment, how to connect and empower people, what you should have in mind, what you should focus on. Um, uh, and that's that's the three parts I will I will talk about. To jump right in, focus on the first um, on the first learn and create belonging through identity. And I said it before, I think it's the fundament for every movement is uh, a shared identity, so to speak, shared values, shared um, yeah, shared interests um, is the fundament of every movement, every community, every organization. And uh, to give some perspective, how is belonging generated? We all know um, that people uh, are social social creatures. Uh, we all want to belong somewhere. We, we do that uh, uh, intuitively uh, within our families, with our friends. We belong to a certain group of people uh, in our neighborhood. We belong, uh, yeah, uh, in the digital world, we belong to Facebook groups. So we search for shared interests. We, sh we search for a like-minded people. And with that in mind, a movement really has to think of what is what is what are the, the values, what is the identity around um, a community, a movement um, is built. So. Belonging is not, in the first place, generated um, by party programs, by facts and figures and arguments. Um, uh, and belonging is also not, uh, in the first place, uh, built by a sense of community. But it's a very crucial factor, of course. But the first step is to think about your values. Think about what are you uh, burning for? What are, what are you passionate about? Um, and uh, for the communication side, um, how to really point that out in your communication um, to um, to speak to like-minded people, to get like-minded people interested. You have to focus on your values, your identity. What are you um, uh, fighting for? Uh, that is that is, I think, the first 
main um, main learning uh, we try to to build in our campaigns. The second thing is lead and people will follow. Every movement needs a strong leader, someone people can connect with uh, with um, on a personal basis. So. Um, uh, that starts with small movements, uh, and we see that all around the world um, uh, in bigger movements. Uh, let's take uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, who's, who really uh, stands as the leader of the climate uh, 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 climate campaign uh, and Fridays for Future and so on. So um, in, a, in a digital world where uh, information floods us every day, uh, it's easier for us to connect with people than with organizations. So it's about people and uh, it's about leadership. Um, and uh, there are examples all around the world. Uh, just one example, one uh, uh, example from the past, but uh, uh, Obama showed us how to build a movement uh, with, with leadership, with uh, a personal story that inspired and connected uh, to people um, who followed him. Um, and uh, of course, uh, and um, this was pointed out by a lot of experts, um, what he focused on in his speeches, in his campaign, uh, was a shared story, a shared value, um, shared cause. Um, he, um, um, yeah, he really uh, connected to, and a lot of other people uh, connected as well. So, um, lead and people will follow. Um, uh, sounds like uh, yeah, like um, a very simple uh, simple tip, but uh, uh, in reality, it's, it's really difficult because you uh, you need uh, the person or a team uh, who uh, really uh, authentically stands for your cause and is willing to share personal stories, personal values, um, and uh, and uh, yeah, changes the communication style. Um, um, from facts and figures to values, identity, and, and the cause. And there are a lot of um, other um, uh, uh, examples out there for, for strong leadership. Uh, I mentioned Greta Thunberg, uh, who stands for, for her cause and, and uh, makes, makes it possible for, for others to connect with. Um, and, um, and leadership also brings, like in politics, like with Obama, uh, brings fans and followers in the community, but also opponents. And that's part of uh, creating a movement. Uh, it's not possible to get everybody out there uh, following your cause, um, but uh, um, only if you are willing um, uh, to yeah, stand your point, uh, uh, stand your values, uh, stand your ground, uh, you will get followers. And the price is that uh, there are opponents who don't share your values, but that what's make a strong movement. The third thing, it's about shared values, not you. I mentioned it before, um, but I give you some examples um, how it's done in, in, in praxis, uh, in, uh, so in, 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 in some cases, because there are uh, many examples who, who are doing great. And on the other side, many examples who are uh, really uh, not doing uh, well in what when it comes to this. What what do you mean um, uh, by it's about you, uh, shared values and not you? A lot of organizations, a lot of our clients um, uh, come from a perspective that they want to tell their community what's important, uh, what to think of today, um, and uh, and think it's about their organization. It's about doing something for a party, uh, doing something for an NGO, doing something for an organization. But you really have to um, uh, flip uh, flip your perspective here uh, and try to uh, make your communication about the shared values and not you. Some, uh, some examples for that. One of my... Um, uh, my uh, uh, one of the funny examples I, I, I like to give is uh, Hard Rock Cafe. I think everybody knows Hard Rock Cafe all over the world. Um, they only uh, they don't uh, not only have uh, like a restaurant and, and cafe and bar. They also have a fan shop. Um, and uh, one could say, yeah, that's like a typical corporate uh, uh, style. Uh, they talk about themselves, but what they uh, what they really 
managed to do is to make their brand something a follower, a, a fan wants to wear and wants to show. So what they managed to do is they by, by producing those T-shirts, Hot Rock Cafe, Venice, Hot Rock Cafe, Vienna, Hot Rock Cafe, San Francisco, someone buys that not to promote Hot Rock Cafe. Someone buys uh, it not to promote uh, the brand Hot Rock Cafe. Someone buys it because they want to say something about themselves. And that's crucial. That's the, the crucial difference between a classical communication, uh, corporate communication and what they do. They, sh they give you the opportunity to share something about yourself and therefore your values. So I wear this T-shirt and I collect those T-shirts not to promote Hard Rock Cafe, but to say and to state where have I been around this world? What have I visited? And of course, I like Hard Rock Cafe and I like the style they represent and I like the, uh, the way of life uh, Hard Rock Cafe uh, and Hard Rock stands for. So to, to think of your communication and to think of your merchandise, to think of your content as something uh, you can provide to your community where they can share something about them and not about your organization. That's that's a crucial part. Some other um, uh, examples um, I found and uh, many of you may know uh, uh, on the top, the female company, um, a brand which uh, 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 and, the, and a cop uh, corporate uh, uh, focusing on uh, female products and uh, female rights. Um, I think they are in Germany, uh, and they have a, they posted a picture on social media uh, which stated he uh, he asked me what's your favorite position. I said CEO. So another example. It's not about uh, we're the female company. We we are great and we um, help uh, females out there, but it's a uh, 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 shareable that uh, that gives you the opportunity to say something about yourself about your values and what shares uh, what uh, what are the shared values you have with the female company another example uh, down to the left is um, the um, uh, uh, american express um, uh, who um, initiated the initiative uh, uh, to shop small businesses uh, so they uh, they stand for um, uh, su supporting American uh, small businesses and they uh, uh, lead this purpose and give uh, the community uh, tips and, uh, uh, and, and uh, raises an event to shop small uh, and support uh, your local uh, small shops. And uh, a company which also focuses on profits like everybody, uh, every company should do but uh, also has a clear purpose um, and um, build something others can connect to and, and share their value. And uh, uh, top uh, uh, on, the, on, on the bottom right is uh, DAF. I think everybody knows the DAF campaign for self-esteem. Uh, the DAF beauty campaign uh, kicked it off. Uh, so um, uh, uh, real beauty was the, the slogan of uh, one of the first DAF campaigns, uh, which focused on um, yeah, self-esteem and uh, body positivity, um, and uh, and yeah, people share their values, people share their uh, point of view, um, and how they want the world to be. And DAF creates an, uh, a campaign system and the campaign content that not says buy DAF products or buy our products uh, or uh, see how great we uh, uh, how what what a great company we are, but um, uh, yeah, really focusing on uh, on these shared values. So, to 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 get some focus, um, what is what's it all about? From our perspective, is to find the sweet spot between brand expression and self expression, between what is um, what is relevant, what is important for the organization on the on the left side. Uh, what are our goals? What are we um, uh, fighting for? Uh, what are uh, our aims? Um, and on the other side, um, uh, what is yeah? What is our target group's um, uh, interests? What are their values? And what do we share? What do we have in common? 
and especially when it comes to communication to focus on this sweet spot in the middle where both uh, circles uh, meet to yeah to found to 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 lay the foundation of a movement it's about shared values it's about uh, talking about uh, what is uh, what are the shared values and not talking about yourself N nobody uh, does something for an organization they do it for themselves they do it for uh, their own values they do it for their own visions um, uh, in life uh, and if you focus uh, in your communication on uh, what shared values you have uh, you can uh, lay a, a strong foundation uh, for a movement and if you have uh, leadership uh, if you have a team or a person who stands for these values um, uh, you, they can uh, give a, a big booster for uh, your movement uh, to, uh, to connect with people to share stories uh, and so on and so on so that was the first the first um, learning I wanted to share create belonging through identity it's about belonging it's about shared values the second uh, thing lower the barriers and raise um, the value so um, I mentioned before one of the challenges that it's getting harder and harder um, for organizations out there to get get people engaged to get people uh, move uh, uh, mobilized so uh, why is that and um, it's just um, uh, one picture but I think uh, everybody knows it yeah that is one of the uh, the driving factors that uh, makes it so hard for organizations for political parties to get people involved because everybody out there is used to uh, yeah the convenience uh, Alexa and other stuff gives us it's getting more and more easy to uh, to buy something uh, you don't don't even have to get up uh, out of the couch uh, and uh, and uh, or get out of bed um, you can say Alexa uh, order a new toilet paper and, and Alexa does the job and on the other hand to make it clear about what I mean on the other hand we see that a lot of organizations a lot of political parties out there build a high barriers to to enter and to connect with the organization um, be it that you have to um, uh, uh, do a membership um, and close a membership with the with the party before you can um, discuss uh, before you can enter before you can engage uh, so what we see on the other side is that a lot of organizations out there uh, make it pretty hard to connect with make it pretty hard to yeah, get in touch and um, and get engaged within an organization and uh, what we see is a big shift out there um, and uh, it's developing slowly some some are uh, further some are uh, uh, more behind but uh, it's developing that parties especially political parties uh, but all uh, all kind of uh, organizations lower their barrier to entry to connect uh, and i think that's that's uh, some good news and that's the way uh, you should uh, you should follow because people want to be part of something greater uh, um, i said that uh, before people want to belong to something people want to uh, uh, be around like-minded people people like to be part of something big part of a movement it's a good feeling to to uh, to get something done but they are only willing to engage little at first and that's um, that's the the crucial part where our lead of engagement, one of our uh, yeah um, uh, patterns we we follow in our campaign, uh, in our campaign uh, planning, in their campaign uh, um, uh, strategies, is uh, this ladder of engagement. The ladder of engagement is our engagement tool, which makes it clear that there are a lot of different levels one can um, can uh, can enter a campaign, and also one is uh, willing to. Um, uh, to follow the campaign. So um, uh, uh, starting on the ground, uh, you have the level of observers. So people who see your content on the different channels, who are in your target group um, um, and uh, who see and, and follow your content. But yeah, they, uh, the, 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 the challenge is to get them excited, to show them uh, here is our leadership. We are about to change the world. Uh, and it's about your values as well. 
The second step is the step of um, followership. So people give you some something to stay in touch with, be it a custom audiences, a custom audience on, on social media to uh, uh, to do a cookie consent, uh, or be it an email address um, or a phone, a phone number, a messenger sign up. So some kind, some some action that makes it possible for you and your campaign to reconnect uh, with the person. On this stage, on this level, uh, the second level um, of the ladder of engagement, people say, I might be interested, we might be like-minded, but uh, yeah, let's see what you've got. And, and, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm willing to listen. And that's the, the most difficult uh, part in a campaign to really show people that they are right, uh, uh, that their, their sign up uh, within the campaign was right. So to really provide them with, um, with uh, content that uh, enlights them and, uh, and shows them that their share w shared values um, um, are, are found in the campaign. Um, the goal is to, to, to get them to the next levels and the next level would be endorsement. So, so a clear commitment to the cause, a clear commitment to the campaign, um, maybe even publicly uh, on a social wall uh, or uh, within uh, social media because they uh, change their profile picture to something uh, about the campaign. So that would be one small next step. Uh, the next part would be one click action and social warriors. So um, this level is called contributors who are taking little time, little actions um, and uh, are willing to engage uh, within the campaign. Maybe visit some uh, campaign event um, join uh, uh, join a, a, a online call and online discussion. So that would be the next part. Um, and then the uh, top uh, top level are grassroots activists and grassroots leaders. I think these are uh, more common uh, within uh, within uh, some of organizations. But uh, uh, and and uh, but the, the 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 thing is that the the ground layers often they're missing, uh, and organizations need to build small steps, small levels uh, where people can interact, where people can uh, connect with the campaign, where people can stay in touch with your campaign to, um, uh, to develop uh, their engagement. And that's um, one of our main um, models we work with, the ladder of engagement. And what helps us uh, and why do we believe um, in, this, in this model and why we see it in, in um, in practice that it, it works are three main nudges we uh, implement in our campaigns. There are a lot, a lot of more uh, nudges out there uh, you might know, but I want to focus and give you some examples for the main three nudges we pretty much use every day in, in, in a lot of uh, content and uh, landing pages and, uh, and campaign stuff. Uh, three nudges to boost your boost engagement and why we believe the ladder of engagement works. The, the first nudge, and I give you some examples, is uh, consistency. Consistency means that people like to be consistent with their identity, with their your sense of self-image, and um, they want, yeah, for example, if, if a person thinks I'm a healthy person, they try to do things they think let's uh, consider uh, as healthy. Um, and in other words, if you get someone uh, to, to give a commitment to your campaign, the chances raise significantly that they are willing to engage uh, more and more later. So it's the uh, tactic of small steps, I would say. So small steps to get them um, uh, connected to, to the campaign, to get them focusing on the cause uh, that a, uh, an, Im an image of consistency um, develops in their mind. So uh, it's it's the tactic that uh, why we believe in the ladder of engagement because in the, on the first levels we try to yeah to to lead people to get a commitment to the cause because we know the chances raise significantly if they commit to something, if they commit to the campaign, if they say, yes, I support this campaign, they are willing to engage more and more later and significantly more than people who don't give their commitment. 
The second thing, and I give you some examples afterwards, uh, is social proof. I think very, uh, very common, very known um, uh, um, principle uh, of uh, uh, yeah, social um, um, uh, social habits is social proof. So uh, being around uh, people who are like me, be uh, doing the same thing as people who are like me or uh, are people I uh, admire. Uh, so testimonials and these, this kind of stuff, stuff is all focusing on social proof. And the third thing is reciprocity. So the, uh, the principle that says, um, if you give me something, I, I, I'm more willing to give you something back. If I give something from the, uh, if I, I get something from the campaign, if I get some, uh, yeah, if, if the campaign uh, gives me uh, some, uh, um, product or, uh, or or content piece that uh, I I, uh, I think uh, is, is valuable for me, I'm more likely to give something back to engage within the, um, the campaign. So some examples for, for these um, uh, three nudges. Uh, one example for consistency and commitment, uh, we did a campaign for CDU um, in uh, the last months uh, before the election campaign in Germany. Uh, it was about the party program. It was about uh, discussing with uh, party leadership around uh, what uh, around the key issues of of the campaign. So uh, something not everybody out there wants to do um, at first. Um, and what we tried to do, we really tried to uh, build this kind of ladder of engagement and uh, try to uh, involve people with small steps, try to get them to a commitment. And what we did um, uh, on the on the one side. We um, uh, we got them to we, we asked them are they are they willing to um, to be part of this discussion? So um, at first we don't we didn't ask them what's your idea what's your uh, what's your um, uh, point of view to some issues. We asked them when we are proceed within this process. Are you willing to to join? So very, we lowered the barrier. Uh, a lot of people said yes. Let's see, but I'm willing to join. Um, and a lot of them, and you see that on the right hand side, a lot of them even state that they that they want to be part uh, with their picture, with their name, with a statement, um, and, and said what's what's important for them. Um, and that's also an example for social proof because a lot of people saw. Uh, uh, like-minded people saw people from different ages, uh, different uh, uh, areas uh, and, and regions of the country. So social proof as well. But commitment was the first step. The next step was little steps, a little step for you, a big for your involvement. Uh, that was uh, one of many emails uh, we sent out uh, for to the party members, but also uh, to people who committed to to join. And you see. Uh, the text isn't 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 that relevant, uh, and, and therefore I didn't translate it. But you see this barometer at the bottom of the email. It was a very simple action uh, someone uh, can to, uh, can take, uh, saying uh, something is more important or less important, or how important is it to me. And that's like uh, with your with your thumb, it's very very easy to do that. And a lot of a lot of people did that. And that was one little step for the. For the supporter, but it, um, yeah, it 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 pro, pro, uh, provided a, uh, consistency and uh, and bonded it more, bonded bonded the, uh, the supporter more to the campaign, and even uh, uh, and 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 raised the chance the chance that people are willing to engage like in in something like that, a, a virtual discussion with six other peoples in Germany around one topic, no one would or, or few people would would do that. At first step, but uh, the most people who engaged uh, within this um, uh, event um, format uh, engaged with little steps before they voted. Um, they, uh, they stated some uh, uh, some issues, um, and um, most people who engaged within um, uh, this digital conversation um, took small steps at first. So that's one of the, the uh, main. Um, uh, principles uh, lower the barriers, small steps. Um, that's a, that's, a, that's an example for that. Another example for social proof and commitment um, uh, campaign uh, uh, 
we didn't, but is uh, is out there and a great example for uh, this kind of kind of nudges. And you see it um, a lot of uh, social proof here in 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 practice. So you see a big number, uh, uh, two million gender equality web commitments and counting. So how many people are following this course? Um, uh, how many social media conversations about that? How, he for she commitments, three point three million um, uh, community events. So you see. Even a, a number can trigger social proof because you think, oh, that's that's a big of a movement and I should be part of it. You even see pictures of people uh, who are also within the campaign. Uh, you see others out there, normal people, not only uh, testimonials, not only like actors and, uh, and models, but also people like you and me who are um, joining this cause all around the world. Another... Um, um, uh, pretty example for how to implement social proof in within your campaign. It's not only pictures of people, not only numbers, but also this like a uh, global map um, where are more activists for this campaign. Um, and if you see your country has low uh, has a low uh, 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 has uh, only few commitments for your campaign, you are more willing to. To engage. So one one other example for for social proof and uh, last example for reciprocity. I um, described it to you. Um, it was a campaign we did for the Austrian Red Cross. Uh, Red Cross. We did a campaign to to get new blood donations and blood donors. And also here we we lowered the barrier to entry. We didn't uh, ask the people in the first place to donate blood, but to uh, take just a quick check and quick test online if they are eligible to, to donate blood. Just five questions. Uh, the most relevant questions, someone might not be uh, eligible to, to, um, to donate. And so 90% of, uh, of users who did the test ended up with uh, perfect, you're, um, you're able to donate blood, um, want to make an appointment. And the thing was, and there, there comes the reciprocity, um, in place, um, most people said, yes, okay, I make an appointment. They uh, jumped to a, a virtual uh, calendar and, and made an appointment. But all of them who said, actively say, no, I don't want to, uh, to make an appointment now, uh, we asked them to, uh, we said, okay, uh, it's fine. We ask you later, but maybe you can, you have other possibilities to, um, to uh, help the campaign. And the thing was, there was a big difference between the people who were sent uh, to this help otherwise page, to this engagement page. Um, over 45%, 46.5% uh, helped after they declined to make an appointment. Um, only 23.8% helped after we led them directly to the page. So uh, we, we took some users and directly led them to the page. Um, um, uh, only 23% engaged. But if someone says no to the offer of an appointment, to the ask of the campaign, they are more willing to do something uh, something different uh, to help. So the, the principle of reciprocity works in both ways. If we as a campaign uh, give value uh, to, to the community, they are willing uh, to do something uh, in, in, in back. But also, it works uh, if uh, someone declines you uh, uh, an ask, and uh, then the uh, the the likeliness, the chance to that they engage uh, increases. I have some uh, uh, some uh, slides left. I, I will uh, uh, give my best to uh, to focus. the The next thing I want to talk about is connect and empower. The last thing um, I want to talk about, um, and what it's all about is. Um, yeah, that if you build this fundamation, a fun, a fundament, this belonging, this identity, if you lower the barriers to enter the campaign, uh, then the next step is to yeah, really treat people uh, not like uh, data uh, who uh, who, get, uh, who get your newsletters, but really like to they, uh, treat them like people who share your values. Uh, your course online and offline and the first step is you really have to 
um, want you you really want to know who is uh, who is behind who is the person behind the data who is the person behind uh, the email address um, and really really want to get to know um, uh, what they're what they are um, uh, passionate for uh, passionate about um, and um, the first thing and the first principle is uh, the campaigning core loop I want to share that with you because it's a very simple uh, but very uh, yeah I think uh, um, uh, useful model uh, to think about communication so what we try to do with the campaigning core loop is to visualize what how we get people to know within a campaign you always have on the left side, we start with a trigger, be it on social media with a content piece, be it a landing page, be it um, uh, uh, canvassing on the street, being, uh, being in an event. But uh, it's always a trigger to get in the conversation. It's always a trigger that leads to a clear call to action, a clear call to action, what, what's next to do, what's the interaction we want, uh, we want from you, be it a social media content piece on the one side, and the landing page to sign up to or to interact with on the other side to uh, cookie consent or um, or uh, uh, sign up with your email address, your phone address, your messenger. Um, and this interaction is, is valuable to us uh, because with every interaction we collect new data, we collect uh, new contacts on the one, one hand side, but also we connect new data around people who are already in contact with us. Because with every data, um, um, with every interaction, we learn about what is, uh, what is relevant to the person, uh, which, email, uh, uh, and which email is clicked and therefore more relevant to the person, uh, which landing page is interacted with, uh, which topic, which issue. Um, um, so everything, um, every interaction um, uh, should be tracked uh, and, of course, fully uh, within the GDPR, but uh, with, with data protection law. But um, you really want to provide those interactions because interaction is the way we learn more about the people. We learn, uh, we learn about um, who they are, how old they are, where they are from, uh, uh, how long they are active, uh, on which le level of the ladder of engagement they are, and uh, Therefore, they may be willing to do um, similar actions. So we have Sarah uh, from Vienna, uh, who is active since May 24th. And um, that her actions showed us that she's on letter of engagement level four. So, so she's willing to, and she did in the past, uh, interact with small interactions. She, she was um, willing to give small time, not a lot of time. She She wasn't, maybe she wasn't on a, on an event or a demonstration like in this picture, but um, but she uh, interacted online. She interacted within uh, with some emails. She interacted with uh, uh, landing pages. Maybe she shared something. Uh, what it's what's important for her. We also collected that her cause, her main cause, is climate change. So we know a lot of uh, of Sarah, and that's just one uh, uh, one example. Um, so that's the goal. That, that's what a campaign. Uh, needs to do really get to know who is behind the data point, uh, who is the person behind it, and treat them like that. And to give you just some quick examples for this campaigning call loop, of course, everything starts with sorry, everything uh, starts with content um, on the different platforms uh, to do it uh, really um, uh, engaging and uh, and with clear call to actions. Um, it follows, it's followed by, yeah, not sending newsletters and uh, just be here, just uh, took an example uh, online from Google. Uh, there are so many bad examples of newsletters. Stop sending newsletters, send personal emails, send emails that really connect to the person, send emails um, that uh, people are really um, addressed about. Um, the next thing would be active community management on all of these um, uh, communication channels. So. Uh, if you send different kind of emails, if you stop sending newsletters, you will see you will get a ton of more um, uh, answers, a ton of more interaction. And therefore, of course, campaign organizations need to step up um, um, their efforts when it comes down to community management um, on the email side 
to really answer their emails, really get connected, get to know the people better. And of, of course, on social media, I see a lot of uh, channels out there which do, uh, which have a lack of community management. And I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges for every campaign to use this interaction to, to uh, uh, get in the dialogue uh, and stay in touch. And uh, we, we have, Lucas, um, um, I, I don't want to, 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 to hold, we have some people, quest, uh, some questions from the audience I would like to, yeah. to bring quickly and not let them wait, but uh, perhaps we can, I, I think you, I mean, you, you have done an excellent uh, overview, uh, almost like campaigning 101 and on, on uh, you know, especially in Europe with a lot of examples in, in Europe. I, I found yeah. that uh, the uh, the people who are following us they are already coming up with with a few questions and maybe it's a it's a good time it's a good time to 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 bring them on board but but first yeah. I would like I would like to to ask or I will use the the privilege and and uh, of being the host by perhaps um, um, trying to move the conversation a little bit forward on something that you touch upon. Uh, and that is, uh, you, you rightly said that, uh, I mean, from, from a branding point of view, people do things for a cost, they don't do it for an organization. You talk about the ladder of, uh, of uh, engagement. And then, and then perhaps I am a hijack in the last part, but uh, this connected and power to me is the, 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 the point where most campaigns fail, uh, in my honest view, because we have a framework or we use a framework uh, whenever we, we talk about movements and social movements in the you know in, a, in the digital era which is this new power versus old power right so yeah. uh, I, for everyone who who is following us it's it's very simple old power means you know top down or organizations where you know order and command the leader uh, you know, you, you don't even dare to to discuss the or to debate the leader's decision, but uh, in a way it has been very successful over the 20th and beginning of the 21st uh, century. That has led to mass movements in the you know mm -hmm. in politics, in unions, uh, you know, you name it, and and also a, a in this old power, people weren't expected to be. A, uh, to be empowered, but pretty much to, you know, follow certain guidelines. Of course, there were always uh, a certain, certain, certain level of flexibility, but you were not there to be empowered. You, you, you were there to, to push the, the, the decisions made by the, by the leader. And of course, mass media communications helped, and we all know that. So a new power is what we have seen, for example, with some of the uh, examples that you have uh, raised uh, uh, in the U.S. mostly following the Obama campaign, we, the, the most recent phenomenon is the is the uh, black Black Lives Matter. Yeah. We see it with with uh, with the Me Too movement, and in the end, what you have this movement is you don't have a leader; you have plenty of them. Decisions are not made in one place, but it is. But actually, the, the people who are part of the movement made the decisions by acting locally, by acting in a decentralized way. And, mm. and what I found in most of the uh, campaigns that I work with is that organizations, and I'm thinking uh, in Europe, they are extremely good now. I think they, if you look, for example, the, the social media of the... European Commission or the European Parliament, I think they've understood that the Europe is not about legislation, it's about a value, no? it's the freedom, mm. the rule of law, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. They have uh, uh, lowered the barriers of entry to participate, and we have seen uh, in the last election, for example, there was this big digital organizing uh, exercise being made, and, and people could, you know, anyone could receive a bag with information about the election day, 
a, a few pins or the goodies, and it was all great because anyone could be part of the movement. It was easily, the, 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 the entry barrier was very low. But when it comes to empower people, that's where we are starting to, to find mm -hmm. difficulties. Why? Uh, and this is, the, I would like to hear your thoughts. Why this happens? My take is that organizations don't want to lose control over messaging. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's a trade-off. Uh, but I don't think you can empower people uh, by giving them a exact line to take. This is not empowering. This is this is something mm -hmm. else. But do you share the same the same view? Uh, and or if not, what do you think? is uh you know it's happening yeah i i i, f I understand what you what you're saying um and i think it's it's um it's possible to do to to do both at the same time to stay in control about the messaging of of uh, for instance a political party and to empower your grassroots organizers and, and, and grassroots campaigners because um obviously there are officials within the party who need to stick to your message playbook who need to stick to your strategy but what a, um, i think a modern campaign organization uh, should be able to do is to give some clear fields uh, where they yeah to give clear um, advice and 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 rules uh, what uh, what people should do in the campaign so uh, basically i think uh, the, the 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 task for a campaign organization is clear um, goals for the grassroots campaigns, and then uh, also empower them with information, with uh, like playbooks. What can they do? So um, that that lowers the barrier as well. People, there are not a lot of people who uh, sit uh, uh, on on their uh, on their desk at home and think what can I do today for the party and for the, the campaign? But if the campaign says, hey, uh, Lucas, um, uh, you want to have some ideas, uh, which are, uh, uh, of course, uh, within our messaging strategy, with, uh, within our strategy of the campaign, but we have some ideas for you that are, uh, you can do. But within those uh, like uh, um, uh, 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 guidelines, uh, you're full, fully free to do whatever you like, however you like, and whenever you like. Um, uh, and so I think both is possible. The party officials, of course, need to stick to the to strategy, to messaging, but uh, you can also give guidance uh, uh, and clear goals what the grassroots campaign can focus on. What do you think, Christoph? Um, actually, uh, it's, it's interesting when you say new power versus old power, because... Um, what I think is that it needs some, some sort of, of coming together of both of these worlds, right? So um, I think organizations nowadays, they have the problem of, of getting into the new power, getting into this organization, organiz organizing part, actually, this grassroots part, um, versus the, um, uh, the, the kind of political startups, <laughs> I would say, um, who, who, who start with a strong cause, with a strong organizing factor, because they have like strong supporters at hand, um, they they would need much more of a communications part. That's what we experienced in the in, in the recent Bundestagswahl in Germany. Um, we we had some some uh, political startups, as I would say, uh, who who candidated there. Um, and, and and I think that it's easy to organize also for Black Lives Matter when you have this strong cause. Um, but still, you need this this communications part to. As, as Lucas said, to, to align behind a, a common strategy, behind a common cause and a common goal. Um, and that's that's where I think it, it, it needs both of these, these things, yeah? And when it comes to empowering, of course, it's um, looking from an organization's perspective, um, it's, it's still too much kind of old power to say, okay, um, empowering is you can give us feedback and you can participate. Um, but empowering means more than that. It's 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 sharing resources. It's um, also also kind of um, letting them work themselves um, behind this common strategy. Yeah. So actually, that that's my two cents on on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think this is the, the 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 big challenge, right? How you you strike the the balance. We I haven't got the the the, the playbook uh, for that, but I think it works more in a one you know case by case, and every organization is different. The grassroots may be something new, maybe something more professional, maybe they they become even way too uh, uh, autonomous that actually results in a speed off. And, and I think it's a, it's a fine balance to be found uh, uh, in Europe, uh, where the culture, I think, is different from the Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, I, I want to go with you, Christoph, and with uh, uh, and to start talking. So now we, we have seen this campaign in one one on one. I want to move to to the the tech part. So what is the technology behind all these campaigns? How because this doesn't happen. Uh, by itself, it's uh, you need people, you need technology, and that's that's why I really uh, I'm really looking forward to your input. But first, uh, we have I'm gonna pick up one question from Santiago. Uh, it's actually for both, uh, and it's a good closure for for the the first part, which is what is in your opinion the most successful grassroots movement that has used social media and data uh, this year. And it could be in Europe or elsewhere in the in the world. So that should give us, you know, what is your two, three top uh, movements that you would recommend uh, to us, Christoph? That's that's actually a, a very tough question um, that 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 I can can really it's it's hard for me to answer because I think um, m most of the successful things that happen. Um, you, you don't quite get from a campaign, so, so it's um, it, it's kind of in, it, in 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 the background. And what I think it's it's not like only in parts of social media or data. And I I wouldn't want to focus this on that because for me it's all in the mix, right? Because social media now is a big big theme. Like um, also like Lucas said, the the channel jungle. Um, that, that's a that, that's a, a, a word breaker, right? Um, this the the social media part is is only one one part of the this puzzle um and i think when when campaigns become really successful it's when they leverage all of their you know all of their the, the tools and all of their aspects not only like social media and data but i think they're the plant of example and, and i think lucas uh, may have some some of them where where you can see okay how how that's working great but I wouldn't want to limit it on, on social media and date there. Okay. I, I fully agree, Christoph. Um, but, um, and, and however, I, th I think there are pretty good examples out there who do a good job. But I think what they all have in common uh, when I uh, have them in my mind, uh, they are not only here since 2021. They are uh, here since a long period of time. So I think a, a good movement, uh, of course, some movements get momentum, uh, so to speak, and may rise uh, from one day and they're, they're up. Like the Me Too movement was there within some some days and, and got bigger and bigger. Um, so one example I gave in my presentation was the He for She campaign. I think they do globally a great job in campaigning, uh, in interacting with the community, uh, in, in getting testimonials involved uh, and, 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 and use social media. Um, and I think other examples always uh, with uh, when when it comes to campaigning are um, uh, are Greenpeace um, and um, and Amnesty International. I think uh, NGOs uh, we learn a lot from them uh, how to really uh, grassroots organize around the cause um, and uh, they um, um, uh, especially Greenpeace I think does a great job uh, on social media and as Christoph said of course. A lot of things not everybody can see because there are the filter bubbles, uh, um, uh, and uh, and I'm not in every but uh, every bubble. Um, and uh, a lot of movements <laughs> are, uh, um, uh, and especially the successful movements are uh, driven regionally uh, from Greenpeace, not globally, but regionally mm -hmm. in Austria, in Germany, um, um, and uh, and so on. So um, I think that's that's a crucial part. Um, they're they're uh, they're willing to invest a lot of time 
uh, and they're on the market uh, of movements uh, more than 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 some uh, some days and months, and they use the different aspects, uh, as Christoph said, uh, social media on the one hand side, but also uh, email marketing, data um, uh, events, uh, and so on on the other side. Here, yeah, and here access also comes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think this is a good example of what you just said. Yeah. I think anti-vaxxers have been there forever. And uh, unfortunately, uh, and now uh, they have they, arise. They, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. So uh, there are a few more questions, but I think we uh, this brings us to a the perfect uh, moment to to transition and to continue talking about campaigning. But uh, now uh, let's have a, a more uh, let's say tech geek uh, conversation. I'm very looking forward for for that. Of course, you need tools to do all that and technology plays a huge part in the in modern campaigns. We have Christoph uh, with us, uh, just for you, let me make Christoph a quick introduction again for those who have uh, joined us in the, in the last few minutes. Uh, Christoph is the managing director of Camp Builder. It's a, uh, I've called it, I've called it the voter relationship management systems but they are mostly, they are commonly known as CRM systems, campaign system. In the end, it's the software that you use to, to uh, mobilize your, your people, to, to build your movements by applying everything that we have learned uh, today with Lucas. And ultimately, it's the, the end goal for everybody to actually win the, the, the campaigns. And, and Camp Builder has been uh, very kind of uh, becoming our networking sponsor this month and together we have chosen this very important topic about how to build movements and throughout the month we have been sharing best practices we have been sharing inspiring movements we've had a lot of conversations and now this is let's say how we top it up uh with with this campaign uh, workshop uh so thank you can builder for for the for the uh, for your trust and uh, i would like now christoph to give you the floor uh, again, tell us a little bit more about you, how you ended up in a builder. Was it a straight line? Was it a more of a Picasso uh, drawing? <laughs> and then and then please share with us your insights for today. You have the floor. Thank, thank you, Sebastian. And, and also thank you for inviting us to, to work together with your initiative. I really, I really enjoyed it. I really think it's a, it's a great initiative to, to come together and talk about these things. Um, yeah, it, it's also looking back, but you can connect the dots, right? Um, so I was uh, a long year colleague of Lucas um, when I started in 2013 as in my 30s as a, as a kind of um, new newcomer uh, in, in politics and campaigning. Um, I also started in campaigning role and, and was the head of development and CTO and responsible for building customized infrastructures for campaigning, right? So, so when we started with Sebastian Kurz in, in 2013, we laid the foundation of our infrastructure uh, for campaigns. And uh, over the years and over the, over the projects, we, we just got, got a sense of what's really needed for, for efficient campaigns. What, what do you need in your daily business? Um, what's working, what's not working? And we kind of put it all together into Camp Builder in, in this tool. And yeah, last year we decided to kind of create a spin-off of the campaign grow uh, to, to, to create, um, yeah, to, to just focus on the software itself, to, to not only enable like kind of agencies to work with that, um, but also enable um, every campaign and, and everyone to create the movement. And that's what, what we're heading to. We want to... Uh, make movements simple. Um, we want uh, to, to create an all-in-one campaign management and, and movement software. And yeah, that's what we're heading to. And yeah, so um, st a lot of ups and downs in the past. Um, it's going to be ups and downs in the future, but um, and enjoy the ups and, and get through the lows, right? So um, thanks, Sebastian. Yeah. Thank you. Uh so we will talk about this. Uh, I think I will. I, I'm curious about a few things, but I would like to give you the, the floor. I think you have a presentation 
uh, to share with us. And so uh, for everyone, uh, please keep sending your questions. I will try to to bring them to the speakers uh, uh, at the end of the the uh, the presentation by uh, Christoph. And now we start our second part uh, with this uh, second masterclass on campaign technology. Yeah, just just a second. Um, I'll be here in a minute. Here we go. And there you go. So is it visible? It's good. Can you see? You can yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, great. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, I have to say that that coming from the from the same background like Lucas, maybe a few things kind of overlap or or are the same. And I, I also saw uh, the same stock image we use, but um, I still think we can can provide some additional information on that. So, so the thing is, um, we we tell our, we, we ask ourselves how to really build a movement using digital tools. What do you need? And when it comes to movements, um, Lucas brought this example. I think that the one thing that always comes to mind is is Barack Obama. Um, and even ten years later, it's still true that everyone kind of yeah wants an Obama campaign. Everyone wants this this tool setup. Everyone wants this emotion. Everyone wants this. Um, yeah, the, this the, the, this rallying behind this common cause to uh, to to get support and and that's that's what everyone's still still looking at. Um, although it's not easy, but right now it's easier than ever before because when you look at the at the technical industry landscape, right from higher ground labs, um, you can quote Steve Jobs. Um, he said, "There's an app for that," and that's true for campaigning. Um, that's there you see all the all the apps you can use to to mobilize people and to create a movement, but the problem is still you need to connect them, you need to work with them, you need to know what to do with them, and the other problem is if you look at what which are the tools made in Europe, um, which are really GDPR safe. You see all the all the ups and downs from from the from the High Court um, and and Bug Schrems to. To think about okay, what what's really safe to use, especially in a political context um, where you where you really need to be safe. Um, there's not that many options left, right? So I think it's still that everyone wants to mobilize, but it's just hard to take off. And that's the situation we are in right now, because for us it's it's very easy to to say that yeah, you can't operate movements on a sales software. Sales software have different um, different focus on, on things. Uh, creating a movement is, is much more than just selling stuff. Um, the other thing is, of course, it takes a lot of experience to know what to do. Um, to Because uh, like a, a fully equipped kitchen um, doesn't let you create um, first class meals, right? You need to be a cook as well. And, and that's, that's the second part. And of course, looking at Obama's movement, everyone's, everyone wants his movement but no one has his budget. And uh, to use all these tools or, and, and getting consultancy, um, not, not even on Obama scale, um, it's really hard to set up and you need uh, a lot of money. So what I think is when it comes to tools, it's, it's not about which tools you use, um, it's what you do with them. And I think that's, that's when we come to the, what you said, uh, Sebastian, the, the old, Old power versus new power is if you want to do your practices that that you've done like for years or centuries um, uh, or decades in between um, to use all this this settings or this approaches just on the digital media and I think that's where 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 most most organizations do wrong just trying to to use their place they used to like. How can I make a perfect print poster, or how can I reach people from door to door um, to to use these principles and just put it on the digital landscape? And I think that's where where most of these the things are wrong. And what I want to, to talk with you about is to to talk about our five rules for mobilization in a digital age. So what we we've seen is and and that's that's one where we maybe overlap with Lucas a little is 
Of course, it's important to treat your community as humans, not as data. I think the digital tools, um, they brought the focus much more on the data part and saying, okay, that's just data. But every data point is a person that does something behind that. And I think that's where, where you still need to focus on coming from a strategy part. Um, and for me, one, one, one conclusion of that is it's demographics versus behavior based. So when it comes to data and to, to, uh, to, to humans, it's, it's about the behavior. What, what are they doing versus where are they from and how old are they? Uh, for me, the best example for me is still a 30-year-old man and a 70-year-old woman can still have the same interests um, when they just became father or grandmother. They are both interested in, in children's future, in education and stuff like that. But from the demographic side, they are completely different. And, and I think that's that what brings it out quite, quite nice to talk about the behavior base. So when it comes to data, it's about getting information, um, what, how are they behaving, what, what are they interested in, and, and not where are they from. And to get behavior-based data, I think that's very important to quote, it's just ask for it. Um, it it's been used like all this, all this data collection or, or, or stuff. I don't think that's, that's needed because when you ask for data the right way, um, people give it to you. Um, if you ask it in a context that, that provides value for them as well, you get this data. And that way you can build your database and you can build your, yeah, your, your system. And coming to your system is the second principle for me and actually the most important part nowadays. It's about owning your data. It's, it's creating your own database. Also in the past, what happens if you don't? Um, Actually, my favorite example. Um, from, from one day to another, Donald Trump lost the, the channel to 88 million followers. Um, and that's, that's the current uh, situation we are in. We, we noticed in Facebook limiting um, all the uh, political targeting um, coming in, in January, much more like on causes, on, on health, on, on sexuality. And, of course, you can argue it's good, but for for smaller movements, it's it's hard to do because they rely on that, right? They um, having an LGBTQ uh, movement is it's important to reach people that are like-minded, and I think that's that's a situation we are in where we need to to focus on to get get hold on your data. I think first-party data is the is the new work like. In word of mouth um, to to get a hand on on your data and have direct contact uh, to your community. And a principle we use on that is called the AIM principle. It's attract, involve, mobilize. It's about using mechanics, using tools, using social media, and all that stuff to attract people, to identify potential supporters, and to address them. And on the next side, it's about getting them involved. Because if you only attract them, like shouting out or sending out without getting a hook on them, getting them involved, it's like uh, going fishing uh, without the worm or, or uh, just, just putting, throwing in the worms into the lake. Um, and I think that's, that's not what you should do when, when you use Facebook or social media uh, to attract people. And as soon as you get them involved, it's about having just a, a small uh, contact point, actually small, or just one contact point, just the email address, for example, um, just to get contact to them again, just to have a way to reach them again. It's not about involving and asking like the whole um, get a member form, like where's your zip code, what's your blood group, what's um, your shoe size. It's, it's just having, having one way to reach them. And, and as soon as you have that, you can use tools to mobilize them, to deepen your relationship with them, to get to know them more, and to, yeah, like, like I said, ask for, ask for their opinions, ask for their data. 
So the stages in specific is when I'm talking about, about attract, it's I think that's that's where social media is is the biggest player. That's where social media is really right to attract new like-minded people, new people who are who are who are good for your movement. Um, but also it's it's about web websites, it's about landing pages, it's it's about offline events as well, it's about canvassing. So it's it's basically all the measures you can do to, to reach people. But the thing is, as soon as you attract, you should always have a way to get them involved. Like when you use social media only to, yeah, to post information. Um, I think it's, it's throwing out money if you're advertising that as well. Um, but you should also get them anywhere where they can give you your data, use a lead form or use landing page or stuff like that. The same is for offline events. Um, for a client, we, he, he did an uh, Austria tour uh, with, with a lot of the offline events. And what we did was we provided a, a tool to have a digital backing for this event. So someone could sign up on this event in the digital scape and say, okay, I'm part of that. And and that way, I think about 70 or 75% of the participants also signed up for, for these events and we got data contact points to, to reach them again. And if you don't do that, they are on the event and then they're gone again. Um, and I think that's, that's what's important to have these attracting measures, but also get them involved. And when I'm talking about involvement, I said that before, it's 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 still the email address. It's still the, the direct contact point that brings you straight into the, the inbox. And uh, and keeping it simple, keeping it stupid, kiss, right? Um, to ask only for the, the minimum of data you can really use. And that's one, that, that's a big advantage of the GDPR because actually they want us to do that way, right? To, to only use data you want to use, and uh, and we saw there's there there have been a lot of of of, of big steps toward this direction since the GDPR that not everyone's asking for all the data, um, but but it's still still the case in in many campaigns. And as soon as you have these contact points, it's about mobilization. Um, we've seen this image before. Um, it's about it's about getting in contact, having a dialogue with your community with these people to evolve them and to get to know them. And one principle that also Lucas had in his, in his slides, um, but I, I brought an example of that, is, is like using this letter of engagement to, yeah, to, get, uh, to get to know them better and to evolve them as supporters. For example, also Lucas had this, uh, the, the Red Cross. They, they asked the, the toughest question you can ask for, right? Give us your blood. Um, and if you, if you just say, okay, hey, um, on the street, and they did it on the street, um, can you give us your blood? Um, I think that's that's a giant step. That's that's really hard to do, and, and everyone's, oh, oh no. Um, so the way we did, and with the campaigning bro, was um, we, we created these steps in between. We asked for, hey, can we count on you in an emergency? And I, th I think who of you wouldn't say yes, right? Uh, and the next question was, okay, are you even eligible as a donor? And when they answered yes, the next step was, okay, can you donate in the next two weeks? Um, that's still better than just ask, okay, donate, blood now. Uh, and when they said yes, it was directly to, okay, make an appointment. And as soon as someone had an appointment, it, it's, it's very, they, they very surely um, donated their blood then. So that's, that's a way where you can can do with 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 small um, with, with, yeah with, with small actions you can evolve your supporters into community leaders or into blood donors or whatever you need um, and that's the same for um, when coming back to new power versus old power I think new power lives a lot from the community leaders this this red step up there um, but still you need old power to get people there or to 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 yeah to to um scholar them or to evolve them to these community leaders and that's on the other side the problem for organizations coming from the old power um 
get people there because they don't have these people yet, but they can um, filter out, they can evolve people to become these community leaders. I think that's that's basically the most um, important way to, to mobilize or build your movement. And how can you ask these steps? For, for us, it's still emails. Um, Lucas also had it uh, in, in his presentation, newsletters. When I'm talking about emails and that's why I'm done right, it's not newsletters. It's not creating an offer with 10 different, or I like the screen from Lucas with 20 different options on it. It's about sending out one message. It's about sending the right message to the right people. It's what basically what you want to do is just like in a dialogue, you want to say, hey, that's my opinion on that. Um, are you with me? With a clear call to action to say, okay, is it interesting for you? And of course, you shouldn't send it out to everyone who, who needs that. You should send it to the people that are interested in that. Because that way you can tailor your, um, yeah, you can tailor your mails, you can tailor your communications. We all used to do that on social media, but I think in email, it's still, um, it's still lagging behind. We're still used to sending out to the whole community all the time. But if you have a way to create target audiences for emails, like you can on Facebook, um, I think it, it's, yeah, it, it's going to be fireworks um, when you do so. <coughs> Speaking of fireworks, it brings you to the next slide um, because of the visual. Um, it's about fast response campaigning. Um, and I think it doesn't matter which tools you use, um, but, but uh, uh, something you, you do in communications is you use every opportunity to tell your message. Um, you want to use every cause, every, every situation to tell your opinion on that and to ask for, hey, are you with me or, <clears throat> or not? To just get into this dialogue, use that as a, as a way to get into a dialogue. And the way you can do it is, for us as a tool, it's still with landing pages. So, <coughs> so <coughs> sorry. Landing pages is, it's not a website. Uh, landing pages are simple sites uh, in the web that, that are not on the website, but, but just for a specific cause. Um, with that way, you can target a specific audience. You can say, okay, um, I only want to uh, <coughs> target people who are <laughs> interested in this topic. And landing pages have the opportunity to focus on a single interaction. Like the email is done right. Um, it's not having a landing page or an information page with 20 different uh, information boxes and here's more information, you can do this or that or this. It's just one interaction. It's asking one question. It's, that's my opinion, are you with me? And if you use tools and that's where it comes handy, you can, you can enable your really fast response. So we see it with clients of us um, <coughs> where it took like <laughs> weeks before to create campaign pages or landing pages. Um, it just takes a day to really get into fast response. When you can skip out the developers, skip out the designers, just have a campaign manager set it up in, in a few minutes, yeah? And that way you can, can really get into fast response campaigning. And actually, this is, if I, um, if I may, and maybe you want to drink some, some, some water in the, in the meantime, uh, I one of the things that uh, I thought it's it's really interesting about these landing pages is sometimes the, the, the barrier of entry, let's say, also in the digital world is that people say, oh wow, you need a new website, and, and of course a new a website is is a lot of work, it's often expensive, mm -hmm. you know, it brings like many conversations about you know branding, etc., and that's just too much hassle. What you are proposing here, right, is, is, is forget about the website or, or you know, your website is, is there for people who want more information when you need to put in front of your audience yes. are those easily readable, simple pages. And in each page, there is a message that is a opportunity to collect data with the right consent. And off you go. You don't have to have all these conversations about, you know, website design. You can even test as many landing pages as you 
uh, as you need and learn from that. No, it, I think this is one of the innovations that I that I can see from from your solution. Yeah, I, I think that's you, you're totally right. Um, I think landing pages don't re replace the website. It's a it's it's a together because what you said and th that's what what I really think is the website is good for information. It's good for being kind of the hub of the campaign, right? To to show your actions, to show show information, but it's very static. You don't change a website very often because it's it's a lot of work um, because you have to see it, all the connections and all the parts. Um, when, when coming to landing pages, it's just, it's kind of temporary offers in the web because the landing page is not built for being there for years. It's built for being there for weeks or days or whatever, right? Um, and that way you can, of course, fastly iterate. You can A-B test these this pages, but it's much more like like not being there and, okay, they are found, but it's it's like the, you can say the post-click experience on Facebook. Um, if you if you click on an advertiser, you come to a landing page where you get it in more detail and you become active, can become active and can, can support the campaign. Because you're much more willing to support something, what you're interested in, this topic, um, via just the general campaign. And I think that's what uh, parties all over Europe um, recognizing right now is that um, that it's it's not about the members anymore it's about it's about the voters it's about the people um, people can vote for your party on this day uh, because they're interested in this topic and vote for another party on the next day because on this region it's it's a different topic and and that's where landing pages come in handy to yeah to create a statement for a specific topic so, so thank you, Sebastian, yeah. Um, and I think the, the next part is when it comes to digital tools is you should try to automate everything, um, automate your communications, automate your onboarding and all that stuff. And a way we, we do that is to, as I said, automate the onboarding, right? Um, because I think everyone's used to, hey, thank you for signing up and that's it. Um, I think what you should really do is to take more steps to get them introduced into your campaign. Um, because we all know the costs of getting someone on board, getting someone to give you your email address. Um, that's, a, that's also a, a bigger step and it creates momentum for that one. He, he said, yeah, okay, now I'm on board. And the worst thing you can do is to just say, okay, thank you, um, we'll talk to you in two weeks. Um, because I think it's it's using this momentum to to getting them deeper and deeper into this campaign, and that way you should and not only send one mail, you should send uh, an onboarding uh, chain to to this um, to this new supporter, like on the first day to welcome him, uh, send out the motivation, tell him ways to inform yourself. After three days, you can send him an introduction to a person who's going to talk to him. Um, you can send him the bigger picture. What are we trying to do? Uh, you can also send him what he can do right now. After five days, you can send him a personal story. You can ask him some questions to get to know him. And that could go on and on, right? Uh, so I think with onboarding chains, um, you have a great way to, yeah, to, to introduce someone into your movement. And I think the last part is, and, and we hear that with new power a lot, is empower your community. And I, I won't go into to details with this now because I think it's that's something very obvious right now, especially when, when someone's um, focusing on, on campaigning, right? You want to empower your people. And I think I said it before, when it comes to, to new power versus old power, it's, it's in the mixture. It's not only like, saying, okay, we, hey, we ask you for an email address so you are empowered or you can, can do this. It's giving someone resources to become active themselves. And I think that's also uh, the thing where, where many things will change that um, organizations will more and more give their, 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 yeah, their, their how do you say that, um, 
give more and more responsibilities to the grassroots um, layer. But on the other side, as I said, it's, it's about the, the coming together. It's not only relying on this because then you, you got 10 people and 10 different opinions, but it's also having, having them organized behind communications. And one little thing from, from my side, that all these strategies, that, that's what we're focusing on when, when it comes to our uh, development, when it comes to Candela. So with Candela, we, we have a solution for digital movements um, where you have this audience base where you can create target audiences for your email. Um, we have it transparent and compliant. Um, everything's done in Europe. Everything's built in Europe. Uh, fully GDPR comp compatible. Um, we got like these landing pages in it. We got the communication parts in it, like emails, like the uh, email automations. Um, and also the numbers prove us right here. Um, compared to the, the common newsletter tools out there, we got um, like 50% more opening rates, 50% more click rates uh, because of the way we, we want you to use emails. And also the candle incorporates engagement apps, like having a way to create this digital backing for events, having a way to create votings, having a way to create um, commitment uh, uh, pages, like someone saying, yeah, I support you. Um, also like user generated content pages and all that stuff. And, and I think when, when it comes to building a movement uh, made in Europe, it's, it's still the number one tool to go to here. So actually that's, that's all from my side for now. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Christoph, for, for moving the conversation forward, because I think now we have achieved the main aim of the workshop, which is to handle firstly the, the strategies and the, the, the best practices, and then map this out with the, with the tools, with the digital tools. And I'm saying that because uh, and we are all, the three of us, we are in the business, and we know also how consultants we, we are. We usually um, uh, come with a predefined idea about what the, the tools need to be because we have used them, because we, we know they work, etc. But sometimes the, 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 the part that needs more work is, is the education about around these tools and around what it means to run a grassroots campaign or to run a digital organizing uh, campaign. And, and on, your, on your presentation, uh, Christoph, I, I found many interesting points. The, the, the first one, which shouldn't, and being in the business that you are, shouldn't be, uh, you know, shouldn't come as a surprise, which is it is important to own your data. And I couldn't agree more. The example of Trump is, is, is the, the most remarkable, but, but there are so many other uh, examples that you can, you can think of. Uh, Facebook, you know, after investing all your money on, on ads, you still don't know who those people are. You don't know who saw your, your, your ad. You don't, know, you don't know them. I mean, you can, you can always get <laughs> uh, the Owning the data is super important. And also owning it in a way that uh, you are very transparent about A, what data you collect, B, what happens with this data once it enters you know, your world, who is uh, accessing it, are you sharing it with third parties, are they even switching to another uh, jurisdiction outside the EU, in the end, how you, you know, and this is how you become GDPR compliant. I, I don't like to, or when I say GDPR compliant, it's, it's, uh, there, is no, uh, uh, there is no test of, you know, okay, you pass, you have become certified GDPR. It's, it's about how you explain to the users in a very <coughs> transparent way what's happening with the data and, and whether this data actually leaves the, uh, to a jurisdiction where uh, the EU doesn't consider that uh, the same data rules uh, apply, you know? And in your case, uh, your solution uh, allows organizations to own that data. You also said all this data is based in, in Europe, the whole uh, infrastructure is built in Europe. What would you say to organizations that come and say, I have this data privacy 
concerns. I'm not sure if I want to really do digital organizing because that will give me headache in the, you know, down the line. What is your usual response also for the people who are following us today? Yeah, I think, um, and we got that a lot over, over the summer, is um, that many campaigns get, get more and more sensitive for that. Because when it comes to campaigning tools, and, and you saw this, this picture of the map, right, um, where, where it's full and, and when coming to Europe, it's very empty, um, is that, that there are many tools out there and you see them in use that are, are, are based in the US. And uh, the, the thing is, if you want to be com completely safe on that, if you want to, um, as you said, um, rely on, on, on everything <laughs> that, that, that's still in Europe, um, then people come to us and, and, and often switch to our system and, and are very happy with that. And to say that I, myself and, and Lucas, uh, we sat in the same room. We, we had the situation before, like, like a few times, um, where from, from one day to another, uh, tools we are used for our clients weren't um, possible to use anymore. And we need to find ways around that. And, and I think it's very, it's very good if you can just check, check one thing off your list. And, and that's what we, yeah, what we want to provide as well. Perfect. Uh, Lucas, do you want, I, I saw you nodding, do you want to jump in in this super important, to me is, is, is probably the most important question of modern campaigns. Uh, so yeah. I, I would like to, to hear your take. Yeah, um, um, I'm happy to do so. Uh, I think Christo, uh, Christoph uh, uh, mentioned uh, the technical part uh, to be sure where your data is collected and that your GDPR is safe and, and can be provides that. I want to answer uh, your question from a, a campaign and strategic perspective. I think uh, you need you, uh, your goal shouldn't be to collect as many contacts and data as you can, but to stay in touch with those people who want to stay in touch with you. So you won't get a, a, a data protection uh, issue with with people who want to engage with you, who want to stay in touch with you. So the the main goal should be to focus on uh, yeah on, on on people who are like minded. And to, as you mentioned before, Sebastian, um, uh, uh, to, to be fully transparent what they're about to do when they sign up. So that is, I think that that's crucial for, for campaigns to, to make clear <laughs> when you sign up, you, you're joining this campaign conversation uh, and you, you can be fully aware what we are going to do with your data. And I think uh, transparency is, is the one thing. And, and the focus on yeah on people who want to to join the conversation is the is another yeah totally uh, must have not not the most I mean, it's a boring conversation to be had but it's probably uh, no. it can take so much more, more, more trouble down the line and I think uh, also the the fact that we that uh, the uh, what I see with campaigns the moment uh, if the issue is already complicated the moment you put all your data outside of the EU, it becomes even more complicated because then you need to do more things to quality, you know, more quality assessments. You need to, uh, you know, you, it's, it's simply, uh, it's, it's a lot more hassle uh, in the end. So I think it's the, the, probably one of the most important conversations to, to, uh, to be had. And it's all also great to have technology being built in, in Europe. We are talking about here in Brussels about the digital champions and the and the transition. But how how can we do that if we don't have our own champions? If we rely in the US as for everything, and so I I, I don't um, uh, um, I'm very happy that we have this type of platforms emerging. I would like to talk to ask Christoph about the the trends that you see in the industry. So you've mentioned a few. Uh, technology trends. So, you, so you, you've mentioned definitely the use of uh, these uh, voter relationship management systems. You've mentioned the, the use of landing page, the, the automatic automation. What, in your view, is happening out there that we should be paying attention to? Mm -hmm. um, so I think is 
when it comes to technologies, it's like the, the channel channel that, that I really like. Um, it's about um, com coming every year. So the technology is very fast paced, right? Uh, who remembers Clubhouse, for example? Um, the, the, that was the thing of, of a year ago, I guess. And I think coming to, to technology is there, there will always come new things. Like the, the, the most important part is still sticking to your strategy. Like also like Lucas said, um, it's it's even if you have a common strategy to to use your data, you can use all the technology and tools you want to. And if you have like this first party data pool or this uh, the, the database where you can aggregate your data into them and use it for your communications, you can use all the tools you you want. But um, what I see is uh, on the technical part is it's surely going to be much more like getting insights, like there are a few tools out there now that, that create, gives you insights on a ge geographic scale to, to see um, where are your voters or, or to, to map them to your data, actually. I think that's that's what the, the next big steps. Um, and, and, and yeah, um, that's, that's basically the, the trend I, I, really, I really see. For all the other things, it's, it's just for me, yeah, get, getting more, more, um, yeah, get, getting more sense of what campaigning is about, and I think that's a trend more than a strategic than a technological trend um, for political parties to 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 keep the let's say movement flywheel right. Everyone's that's a, a thing with social media as well. Everyone's thinking from election to election and starting on the the flywheel again. And or the, the kids carousel, and and has has a lot of work to push it. Uh, instead of when you look at NGOs, when you look at organizations, they they are doing pretty well because they have this constant this constant campaigning, this constant uh, activation of the community. And I think that's where we're right on the shift that that more and more parties notice that it's it's important to keep keep communicating and keep. Uh, campaigning, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, Lucas, uh, you have worked uh, with in the private and also in the public sector with campaigns. I mean, if I ask you, what do you think is now in the minds of some of them, but will actually uh, become real next year? What type of, you know, strategies or even technologies do you see that will be shaping next year, which remember in the next year we have French election, we have a Hungarian uh, ele election, probably Poland if they do a snap election, and we have many others coming. We have the midterms. So, I mean, what's going to happen? What's going to be the story for these elections? <laughs> um, um, I fully agree with what Christoph said. And in addition, I want to, to add that I think, like, like every time, uh, Europe is some years uh, behind the US. So I think what we can expect uh, in the next years is that uh, uh, more and more parties and organizations are focusing on own data and owned networks. Like uh, when you follow the US election campaigns, uh, we saw a lot of uh, both, both parties focusing on building their own social networks within their community, building their own platforms. So I think that that I would expect, um, um, especially when when we follow what uh, uh, what the developments are around Meta and and uh, Facebook uh, uh, and Metaverse, um, uh, where political advertisement gets uh, more restricted uh, year by year. I think uh, we, on the one hand side, own data and own networks. On the other side, we we come back to the roots. I think back to groups, back to uh, Facebook groups, back to uh, messengers, um, like we see in the pandemic as well. Um, I think we we will have this rise on Telegram and, and Facebook Messenger um, uh, also in the next years. And I think one big change for, for the upcoming elections is that uh, after two years of pandemic, the people are more used to virtual events, virtual um, happenings within a campaign. So maybe that's a, a upside for the European election um, people are more used to digital uh, campaign rallies, so uh, uh, maybe that uh, closed the gaps between the different regions in Europe. 
Yeah, I totally, I totally see the uh, the uh, um, the the use of the instant messaging. I think it's it's already exploding, but it's 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 not mainstream. I would mm -hmm. say. Uh, so anti-vaxxers to tie back to the first question. I think they. This is how you explain their their success. Uh, they are operating via, you know, underneath the under the radar. Uh, so I expect campaigns to be using that as well. We also, and to reference back to our own playbook, we we also see a greater interest in programmatic advertising. Something that in the in the private sector is, you know, it's like brands like Coca Cola they do this. Yeah. Like, uh, every day, but I think it is starting to, to 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 come to the to the political space and especially to to buy uh, very quickly and be very uh, agile in putting display uh, or buying display ads to show your video, trying to buy as many non-skippable seconds as you can uh, get, so that people have no option but to actually watch uh, your your content and of course of course to do that you need this what is called this demand side and buying side platforms that are so often used in the private sector i have started to have conversations and we had a conversation about that in the playbook too and i'm hoping that the pro european campaigns that uh, or at least where the europe is going to be at a crossroads i think it's going to be in france next year so let's hope the Anyone who thinks the EU is is a good idea is something worth keeping. Not perfect, but definitely something worth uh, keeping better than the alternative. And we can look at the UK to see how this alternative is, you know, is working, whether it is working or not. There, there was a a poll not uh, not long ago saying most of the British they think they are not uh, better off after after Brexit that the there has been fuel shortage. There has been uh, other type of shortage in addition to to everything else, to the drop in trade, etc. Um, so I'm hoping all this and our aim and focus from now until uh, the elections in France is to try to put all these best practices and technology on the table so that the right campaigns can use them and beat the the bad guys, as I as I call them, of course, in a uh, you know, in a figuratively, uh, figuratively way. So thank you. I think our time is up. I think it was great. Uh, one note for those who have followed us and have missed someone, uh, we couldn't get uh, Nadia Olechku with us, but we will bring her soon. She had something very urgent, personal that she needed to attend, and uh, she couldn't make it in the end, but we will make sure that we top this chat with her experience uh, about how they have applied all this into a specific context, which is Poland and the fight for women's rights. So very sorry that she couldn't uh, be with us uh, today. She really tried, so she's excused. And thank you uh, again, and hope to see you in the next campaign workshop. Thanks. Thank you.